Okay, looks like we're live. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Switzerland session of the Women in AI Global Summit 2020. My name is Marisa Chop. I am the Women in AI Ambassador for Switzerland. I'm also a researcher at Skipage, which is a cybersecurity company based in Zurich. Yeah, so Women in AI, we are on a mission to promote um, gender equality. We are on a mission to, well, let's be bold about it, to make the world a better place. Um, I mean, gender equality is not only a fundamental right. It's, 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 it's necessary. It's a necessary fundament for a prosperous, for a sustainable world. And um, I know we all want to, you know, save the world and make it a better place, but, you know, nobody here can do everything. But we all can do something. And this is our vision, and this is what we're here for, and this is what we want to remind ourselves today is that, yeah, we are, and you've probably heard this a lot the past months and weeks, we are all in this together. And, um, yeah, making the world a better place is a collective effort. So that's why we're here. Women in AI Switzerland has three mantras. Mantra number one is, Content is king, always and forever. Diversity is easy. It's not, but let's try to shift the focus. And number three, transdisciplinarity is key. For complex problems, we need a diverse, a heterogeneous group of people to discuss that, to solve that. We need these perspectives. And along these lines, we have tried to create a diverse and heterogeneous group, uh, a group of speakers that will share with you their insights and uh, how the Swiss AI landscape looks like beyond chocolate and cheese. So thank you first to all speakers who, have, who are providing their content now. Thank you, Team Women in AI, global and local, for putting this tremendous effort together. And thank you, Priska Burkhardt, who will be the moderator of this Switzerland session and who will guide you on this journey, this Switzerland journey. Have fun and enjoy this next hour. Bye. Thanks a lot, Marisa. Thanks for having me today. I'm super happy that I'll be able to moderate today's um, panel, the Swiss panel for women in AI. First of all, I want to thank Women in AI Global, but also the DAF region for their effort to bring more diversity into the AI space. As Marisa said, my name is Priska. I'd like to introduce myself a little bit as well first and give you some insight what I am doing. Um, I am the co-founder of TechFace and I have been working in the tech industry for almost 20 years. When I started, I was a career changer. So I came from a more medical background into the tech industry. And it kind of never really occurred to me that there is an issue with diversity in tech up until maybe three or four years ago when I started my own business. We also started building up a non-profit community here in Switzerland. And I've met many interesting and exciting women in the tech industry and realized they are struggling with finding their position or their place in the tech industry, but they were very keen getting into the tech industry. And at the same time, we were also meeting with a lot of companies who were open to increase their diversity into the, in their tech teams, but were at the same time struggling finding those talented females. So for us, it was clear that we need to provide some support in this area. This is when we started with TechFace. With TechFace, we actually want to bring more opportunities to female tech candidates, to female tech talents, to find their spot in the tech industry. We want to show them what is possible. We want to help career changers getting into the tech industry. And we also want to support those who have already experience in the tech industry to lead a successful and, for, and also specifically a purposeful career in the tech industry. And so this is was also one of the reasons why I met with Marisa and got to know the women in AI team. And we share these values, we share these common goals, 
And I think it's great that we can share this today with a lot of people around the world with this um, Women in AI Global Summit. So yeah, let's get started. We have four really inspiring, interesting speakers in the panel today from Switzerland. And for us, it's specifically to um, showcase to the listeners out there what Switzerland is doing actually to shape the AI landscape. So let's get started first with Chavaira. Chavaira is a doctoral candidate and a Marie Curie ITN fellow in the field of robotics at Human Computer Human Interaction for Learning and Instruction Lab at EPFL. In short, it is called Chile. She is very passionate about case causes such as safe and unbiased AI, gender empowerment, education for all, and discrimination-free society. She currently works towards building human-robot interaction technology, leveraging AI to help improve learning environments for kids. She is also the lead of women in AI in education. Today, she will talk about the question often asked on how to use AI in the educational environment, and will be answering this with her work at the, with her research at the Chile Lab. Welcome, Chavarga, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Priska. So welcome everyone. I hope that you're all doing well wherever you are. And just to give you a context quickly where I'm located. So we're here, Chile Lab, we're located right next to Lake Geneva. So if you're ever planning to visit us, do that in summers because it's a really good time to be here. So coming from a lab where we focus on educational technologies, this quote by Benjamin Franklin actually hits home for me because it's in very simple manner, it conveys the message of how learning can be effective. So it's not about handing something to someone in a plate, but it's rather more about being part of the experience. And then next, we ask this question that when does learning actually occur? So I think that we can all agree that learning is a lifelong process that occurs from when we're children to when we're old. And um, the type may change along the way, but it's a lifelong process. And also learning is not something that we just do like in schools, the subjects that we're learning, but it's much more diverse. It includes learning transversal skills, cognitive skills, and motor skills, among some things. So in our lab at Chile, um, we basically focus on developing technologies that target some of these facets of learning um, and we also target various age groups, and also we try to do it in, a, in an effective manner, as I just elaborated with the quote from Benjamin. So um, I think the researchers from this domain can agree with me, and I speak from my experience, that we're often asked certain questions, especially from stakeholders in this arena, whether it's teachers, parents, or therapists, and I think that one of these questions comes from a place of feeling threatened, that if we're developing these AI technologies with robots or machines, are we targeting to replace humans? And that why are we using AI for educational advancement? Like, is there a value that is being added? So I would want you guys to keep these two questions in your mind. And from this point onwards, I'm going to talk about two pro projects from my lab one that targets cognitive skills and the other one that targets motor skills. And then through that discussion and through that research, I'm going to come back to these two questions and answer them from my perspective. And I would really be interested to hear how you think about them too. So the first one, cognitive skills, it's basically around my doctoral research. And I would like to start with this quote from Stefan Wolfram. So I think that we can see in his words the urgency in the efforts to like to bring uh, computational thinking in educational settings at a very early age. And also we're seeing the rise of robots in educational settings with the intuition that they're going to help us in advancing these um, computational thinking skills. But the fact of the matter is that crafting pedagogical designs and robot interventions that truly succeed in achieving such objectives is challenging. And to date, it's an open question. So inspired by this, at the start of my doctoral research, along with a colleague of mine, we developed a platform called Just Think, where the aim is to impart computational thinking skills through game-based algorithmic reasoning activity. 
and to uh, promote collaboration and also to serve as a platform for evaluating and designing robot behaviors that are going to help in advancing learning. But the problem is that whether it's a human teacher or a robot or any other machine, there are certain challenges in some in, in these kind of environments. And I'd like to highlight a few of them. So I, I think the first one with um, activities that target computational thinking skills like just think where the nature is very exploratory, the children are exploring and exploiting um, to understand the underlying concepts, it's very hard to analyze them. So to simplify things, um, we often end up looking at performance as a measure for learning, but the problem with that is that activities that target, that are grounded in um, learning by failing paradigm, performance cannot be a predictor for learning. So when humans try to simplify these things, sometimes stereotypes are born. And um, I think the second uh, example of simplifying things is mostly in HRI settings, the engagement of a child with the activity is looked at having a direct link with their learning. However, we haven't been really able to validate that. And there are reasons to believe from educational theories that this may not be the case. It may not be as simple, the relation between engagement and learning. And this is one of the aspects that I'm looking at during my PhD. And this brings me to my third point, which is subjectivity. So more often than not, in HRI settings, human annotators are asked to provide labels for, for building models where, uh, where, they, where they tell that if a child seems to be engaged in the learning task or not. But the problem with this is that, as I mentioned, that since it's really not that easy to analyze learning from visible cues, they end up providing labels that may just be based on their connotation of what something looks like. And hence, we end up having low inter and intra rater agreement. So in two words or in two lines, what are we doing to tackle these challenges? So I'm looking at a combination of multimodal behaviors and domain specific metrics like learning gains and various AI techniques. And fortunately, we have seen that it looks like there is a potential actually to move away from these limitations. So our system is trying to actually solve the real problem and not the simplified version. And without going into details, I'm just gonna highlight a few interesting results that we're getting from the system is that students can actually be failing in the task, but learning in the process. And then there is no one way of learning. And then we can also see different profiles of high and low learners. And if we venture a bit deeper into that, we also see that a behavior itself may not be absolutely right or wrong. And what I mean by that is that usually frustration is considered to be negatively linked with learning. However, in our system, we found that it was found like highly present in both low and high learners, but it was the set of other behaviors that basically decided if these children will end up learning or not. So, until now, I've been talking about cognitive skills, but what about motor skills? Like how can AI be leveraged here? So I think that there are many parallels with what I just discussed. So consider the problem of dysgraphia. This refers to handwriting problems uh, from moderate to severe, which can become long ter term if not handled early. And then they hinder performance overall for children because they lag behind and they lose confidence among their peers. So currently in French-speaking countries, uh, the standard test, which is a paper-based test, BHK test, is used, but there are certain challenges with this one. First, it's time consuming. So at least five minutes are needed for a child to write and then 15 minutes by a therapist to analyze. And then it's also costly. You need to buy a paper. You need to train an expert. And then again, it also suffers from the problem of subjectivity. And then it only focuses on the static characteristics of handwriting. So there is a lot that is lost in the process. So a colleague of mine during his PhD, he developed a tablet-based app that captures uh, the handwriting characteristics of children more than 200 times per second. And these features are actually designed along with the help of therapists where now not only static information is being used, but also, dynamic information like the speed and handwriting, uh, sorry, the speed and pressure um, from the handwriting. And we see that there is a lot of significant information coming from these features that were otherwise being lost. So 
The brain behind this app currently is an unsupervised learning algorithm, which means that we are moving away from human-based labels. It is fast, only needs 30 seconds instead of 20 minutes. It's inexpensive, one-time investment, and it's not binary, which means that it not only tells you if a problem exists or not, but to what extent the problem exists. And then secondly, it's also multidimensional, so it just doesn't tell you the problem exists, to what extent, but also where the problem exists, so that effective interventions can be made. So I must mention here that while the remediation activities are being um, suggested by the app, it's the therapist who makes the final decision. So now this brings me back to the big questions. So we're incorporating AI in educational settings. Does that mean there is um, we're going to end up replacing humans? So my simple answer to this is no. I, I, I don't think that there is a need for that because as I see, AI is very complementary in its nature to human intelligence. In both the projects that I showed here, AI makes visible what humans cannot see. So it's not seeing more than humans or it's not seeing less than humans, but it's seeing differently than humans. And the way it looks at data is based on complementing human uh, abilities. And with this information that is suddenly now becoming available with this additional layer, we're able to under deep like have a deeper understanding of the learning process and then who should we help and who not and how. On the other hand side, the same characteristics that make humans very subjective on the perception side, it makes them more empathic on the intervention side. So I think humans are better at capturing the overall interdisciplinary nature of the problems when designing educational technologies and that basically helps them to provide support in more than one way. So as I see is that both of these intelligence is natural and artificial intelligence, they need to coexist in educational arena. And um, I would also like to mention that, okay, we, if we have the features that tell us that, okay, when a learner is um, engaged in a manner which is conducive to learning, is that enough? So it's not enough on its own because it still wouldn't give us the information to design effective interventions. So we actually would need to know what are the decisive features. And then that brings me to the to another point that AI needs to be, it's crucial for AI to be interpretable in educational settings. And I think it's not a surprise because we're trying to have that in many other domains as well for effective interventions. So I think that in this quest to answer whether humans are going to be replaced by AI, I think we also find the answer to why AI is needed in educational advancement. So before I end, I would just like to show you the faces in the team. So we're actually a very multicultural group of people. And I think that this diversity adds to the robustness of solutions that we're actually all striving for in this arena. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. Um, if you have any questions regarding the research or you would like to collaborate or you want to know more about education, women in AI educational activities in Switzerland, feel free to contact me here or on LinkedIn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chavaira. So um, the stage is now also open if you have a specific question. But let me quickly um, start. I mean, it's, it's very interesting what you just showed us. But do you believe, can technology improve learning on all age levels or only for kids? So I think that I strongly believe that it can help at all age levels. And just to give you a small example from my own lab, and there are many other companies and labs out there, so um, they would be doing much more stuff as well. But just in our lab, we have, um, we have uh, technologies that are affecting children from a very young age on handwriting side. Then we're targeting cognitive skills for middle-aged students. Then we also have technology that is helping with upper arm rehabilitation for elderly. So I think that it just needs to ha add value to existing practical problems. It should be complementary to humans and it should uh, be interpretable. And um, yeah, great. I especially in your talk, I also love the quote about um, failure that there is actually no failure in learning, but failure itself it's, it's a learning. Can you also share maybe your view in regards to the future of human robotics? 
Um, so I think I would just reiterate. Uh, I mean, I can talk from the per, um, from the perspective of human robot interaction, especially in the educational side. But I think that whichever field it is, I would just reiterate the last message I had that if if the if the product that we're trying to build adds value to an existing problem and it's better at that than humans on some aspects, and then it's complementing, which means that it is complementing the aspects that humans are better at um and uh, thirdly if it's interpretable so it, we can we can always say when can we intervene and how can we intervene i think that that is going to make something successful in this arena human robot interaction otherwise thank things can go and we can see that thank you very very much for being in the panel today sharing what you are working on that was very interesting very insightful and I think it's also then um, right now a great opportunity to move to our next guest speaker, who is Simon. And he is a head of People Analytics Research Group at the University of St. Gallen and works since 2016 on a research project that investigates how big data will influence the workspace and how technology changes the way we work together. So this is, um, I feel, quite connected to the speech we had before because he will talk about his research today and how the workspace of tomorrow will look like from robots being your work colleagues to manager who have to lead during or in this technology age. And also, of course, the moral decision implication we have when working with machines. Simon, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Priska, and hello, everybody, from wherever you're looking at this um, Swiss chapter of Women in AI's Global Summit 2020. Uh, welcome to my short presentation on leadership inside technology immersed workplaces. And in fact, I feel very honored to be part of the Swiss chapter of Women in AI, contributing insights into how the Swiss AI landscape is shaped from a researcher's perspective. So uh, this is me, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time on talking about myself. So I'd rather say, let's get started. I think, uh, as you all know well, datafication technologies are on the rise in the workplace, right? We know of, for instance, face recognition algorithms as parts of um, Las Vegas casinos performance management systems, where car dealers smiling appears as a novel performance indicator. We also know of Japanese companies that have installed smart toilets analyzing urine to infer promotability or performance. More recently, we also read in the newspapers of algorithms as novel CEOs and as parts of executive level committees promising, let's say, a more pinpoint and algorithmic corporate governance. Yet it appears that datafication technologies are inseparable from workplaces and that they have become an integral part of its effective functioning. So as researchers always do, uh, we start by defining the core constructs we are looking at, right? In this case, I want to start with the central term of datafication, which is in essence an all-encompassing measurement of employees, more precisely the translation of every fiber of the employee and his or her social relationships into manageable zeros and ones. More precisely, as you can see on the left side, I want to outline two prominent socio-technical functionalities of datafication technologies that particularly drive datafication in the workplace and, in a consequence, the automation of leadership. These are foresighted and prescriptive capabilities of AI and ML. First, foresightedness means uh, that an algorithm can develop and refine its capabilities from its analysis enactment itself, and that it can autonomously apply these capabilities to original, but also to novel application areas. For instance, the IBM Watson algorithm is a salient example of foresightedness, as it was originally trained to identify dark pictures, but is now used to play Jeopardy or even to identify high performers in Google's working teams. The second capability is prescriptive 
capability of technologies. And that means that these algorithms can recommend managerial action. And this recommendation is based on a likelihood evaluation of existing alternatives. In line, for instance, with the 2020 review findings of Le Pignotti and colleagues, these prescriptive capabilities mean that um, predictive ones like forecasting uh, capabilities are embedded into a probabilistic context to provide adaptive, automated, time-dependent and optimal decisions. To make this a little bit more concrete, a salient example of prescriptive capabilities is Amazon's firing by algorithm policy, where human leaders get to know from, let's say, contract termination once the employee's access badge is no longer valid. So, as said this, we also need to define what is meant by leadership when we're talking about leadership in technology, immersed workplaces, surrounding datafication technologies. A first, and in my opinion, very intuitive approach is that of David de Kremer's most recent book, where he differentiates leadership from management. With regards to the study of leadership in such technology immersed workplaces, this approach holds one great advantage, namely that it's clear about the functional targets. In this sense, management, for instance, equals bringing order, stability, and consistency to the workplace via functions, let's say, organizing functions as planning or standard setting or budgeting. And if you will, as a summary, management equals bureaucracy. Consequently, leadership targets comprise more proactive, more future-oriented, or more emotion-based functions that drive the company further, that communicate the corporate vision, for instance, and even deliver the necessary changes in the workforce. In this vein, leadership is more to trigger the employee's willingness to be led. To put it differently, to stimulate their buy-in into the company and its strategic goals. And also, because if no one wants to be led, there might be no need for leaders, question brackets closed. So um, this slide, in essence, summarizes the functional approach we are talk taking when we talk about leadership in technology immersed workplaces, and I've just briefly sketched them. As you can see, for instance, the Lord conceptualization from 1977, task performance as one group of leadership function comprises developing plans, coordinating behaviors, or removing barriers. Whereas, in contrast, group maintenance comprises, let's say, stimulation of high task motivation, the fulfillment of employees' non-task needs, or reduction and prevention of conflicts. The Morgan's in 2010 article, in essence, does the same thing as the early conceptualization of Lord. And as you might have retrieved, the distinction is holds still valid back in these days of these conceptualizations. So, having set the stage, we have analyzed how these technologies alter the way leadership is done and executed in today's organizations. And we've done this by means of a morphological an analysis borrowed from rocket science to capture this evolving phenomenon. And this capturing is achieved via the morphological framework. This is basically a construction manual of um, the span up of a space of possibilities of these boxes, which constitute defining properties of actual and yet to develop manifestations. Just to make this a little more intuitive for you guys, I just want to highlight four prominent building blocks of these of this uh, morphological framework. And the first is that datafication technologies can also formalize workplace norms and culture compliance as novel targets. That is, technologies can determine what employee behaviors are desired and appropriate. Secondly, datafication technologies are also able to include vast amounts of unstructured data, verbatim data, and contextual data. That is, for instance, they can capture how friendly people behave or read between the lines. Third, they contain a function creep momentum. That means that people and employees do not really understand the functionality because of the learning capabilities. The entirety of functionality cannot be predicted before the actual use and implementation. 
And finally, as we all know, datafication technologies can capitalize on prescriptive functionalities that comprise the most sophisticated form of automation compared to descriptive or predictive ones. So in summary, we can delineate the four following statements that datafication technologies increase internal complexity of how to lead effectively. They can broaden the extent of leadership targets as we have seen, for instance, towards workplace norms and culture. They do automate the execution of leadership functions without human involvement. And they even permeate spheres inside workplaces that were previously believed to be immune from automation. For instance, the reading between the lines argument. So what do we do with this? What about leadership in these technology immersed workplaces? Do we need human leaders at all? And our argument is yes, we do. As we have theorized in our most recent paper, datafication technologies do automate leadership to a large extent. However, there will remain two, we call them Gallic villages of human leadership that cannot be automated to date and in the midterm future, hopefully. And from this, we inferred our second statement that given these two Gallic villages, employees will face two boss situations one algorithmic boss and one human one. And this brings me to my last slide to elaborate a little bit more about the Gallic villages of leadership automation. So where the human advantage still will be valid given the progress of sophistication of technology development. The first is jumping back and forth between the functional targets. That means given the complexity and changing needs and demands from workforce and markets, likewise, leaders will have to executive multiple functions at a time, will have to maintain, for instance, the smooth interaction of various technologies and employees, and have to engage, let's say, similar to agile piloting behaviors to continuously monitor, for instance, if algorithms still work in the sense of the inventor. And this is something an algorithmic event logic is unable to perform. The second Gallic village is labeled uh, leading in the unexpected. Given VUCA and also COVID, what we have all painfully exper experienced, leaders need to manage the unexpected more prominently in the upcoming years. This emphasizes the importance of contextualization of leadership as the first and foremost effectiveness criterion. In other words, the most efficient solution is not necessarily the best one. Recall, for instance, the hiring biases of algorithms. In some, an algorithms as super carriers of rationality striving for the best generalized solution, they cannot effectively handle the so needed trade-offs, for instance, with regard to the prevailing HR philosophy in the company. So this brings me to my last slide and also food for thought in the discussion. I want to highlight these three areas that made us believe leadership in technology immersed workplaces needs to address. More precisely, the two bus situations make several trust challenges emerge that need to be addressed in order to main, uh, remain an effective workplace in the 21st century. These and maybe even more, and you guys will be, I'm sure, way have a greater mind on more and more trust challenges. Uh, these need to be addressed of those leaders in the 21st century that do not want to be abolished by themselves, but to contribute also to the future value of the company. Having said this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to have your questions and let's engage. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Simon, for all this. Um, I'm a little bit worried that my future leader is going to be a robot. <laughs> but I hope not. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, that, that there will be two of them. Um, I don't see any question right now. Maybe they're coming so up. Let me ask you a first question in regards to the situation here in Switzerland. Mm. How do you see Switzerland standing in regards to workspace um, work technology? Are we advanced? Are we behind? Are we in the middle mm. field? Where do we stand? 
Priska, I would be a little more cautious in terms of are we ahead or are we behind? Because um, I don't want to be ahead, for instance, compared to what we see, in, uh, as I've said, in Japanese companies where uh, toilets can analyze urine and then infer a promotability score, for instance. I don't want to. I don't want to envisage such a workplace, or I don't want to have cameras to instantly analyze my facial movements to infer my performance, for instance. So I'd say yes. We uh, the Swiss analytics market is not as mature as compared, for instance, to Japan or the U.S. But um, depending on what you mean by um, by a good workplace or a, a, a workplace you want to work in. For instance, I value, and this is what we see in our survey, for instance, of 2020, that for instance, the, uh, the corporate ethics and also the legal framework inspired from general data protection uh, law of the European Union constrains what is possible in the workplace and also defines the rules of the game of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I, and even though we are a little, little behind the, the US and Japan, for instance, I'd say uh, this is the right way to go. Perfect. Thank you very much for sharing Welcome. all this today. Welcome. And after having heard so much about research, I think we need to also understand a bit how research is the, being placed into practice. And for this, we have our next speaker, Ricardo. Although Thank Ricardo, you, bye Simon, thanks. Ricardo is also a researcher for more than 12 years and um, has experience on the human machine interaction, brain machine interfaces, and of course, artificial intelligence. He is today the head of the Swiss office of Claire, which is a bottom up initiative to strengthen the research community in, on AI in Europe with over 300 members. In his talk today, he will present what Claire is doing, what the network is doing, the activities to link AI research with practice, meaning from a conceptual approach to application, as well as the EU support proposal to build private public partnerships. Thanks a lot for being here. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you to the Women in AI for this invitation and thank you all for following today. Um, and I will want to take uh, a few minutes to talk about this CLARE initiative uh, that uh, Briska introduced uh, that goes into human-centered AI. And the two previous uh, presentations, I think they they set a very good um, a good setting by showing how these technologies can affect different aspects of our life, in one case, education, in the other case, leadership. But also, we see how the development of these technologies has a geographical aspects, how the different uh, actors in the world are interacting to push further and steer this technology towards different ends. And uh, the idea of Claire is to strengthen the European community that is devoted to AI to promote excellence in research and innovation with a very clear um, motto. It's a motto of AI for all, all of AI with a human-centered focus. What does it mean? Does it mean that the, <clears throat> the benefits that these uh, technologies can provide, they should benefit, the, they should reach the entire society. And also that we have to take into account that there is not a single way to approach AI. There's a very different ways to take these new technologies and to translate them into something that can be useful for the different uh, stakeholders. And I think this is one of the, the very important aspects that we have to, to keep in mind whenever we try to approach the development of novel technologies, in this case, AI. And this human-centered focus, which is the third part of our motto, is a very, very important aspect that we need to keep in mind. This means that we have to take into account what are the needs that we want to fulfill with this technology, what are the particular um, stakeholders that are um, that are affected and are involved in these applications, and also take them and make them uh, 
active actors of the development of this technology. So this is a, a general approach that we are taking. And the way in which we are trying to achieve that is by establishing a, a strong network, a strong research network at the European level. Is it uh, as of today is um, it counts more than 380 research groups that are in different uh, countries in the in Europe and here Europe is not only the European Union but also other other associated countries like Switzerland and in this sense I'm quite happy to talk about European initiatives from the Swiss perspective because this is one of these examples where we can be stronger together so all together this research these 380 research groups, they count about 21,000 people working with a, an interest on AI and also that have uh, adhered to this vision of the human center focus. So we have a lot of critical mass in Europe and we need this critical mass to become stronger and stronger. And ways for, <clears throat> for doing so that are, we, are, we are now pushing forward is to establish regional excellence centers. This is one of the ideas that we want to, to develop that is also resonating with uh, many actors in the, in the European AI landscape so that we can have regional excellence centers combined with an AI hub or a lighthouse for AI. And I think this is one, one of the main characteristics of the vision that we have for the development of AI, where we can have at the same time concentration of resources, in this case, minds that can push this, um, these ideas forward, but at the same time, taking into account the different, um, different uh, perspective, the different sensibilities that we can have in all the region that we have in the European landscape, and of course, also the world landscape as well. So this network has grown to have this, uh, as I said, more than 300 groups all across, uh, all across Europe on different aspects of AI. I'm not gonna enter into the details of the numbers, but uh, I think it's also important to mention that we are, are organized as well in terms of different national offices, because each country has its own perspectives, its own particular perceived needs and its own sensibilities regarding AI development. So this is a way of really taking into account and put uh, at the benefit of the, of the society all the richness and diversity that we have in Europe also applied to the development of AI and also having all these different um, approaches really following this human center vision. <clears throat> of course, this is good to have a strong research network, but this is an endeavor that don't, not only involves researchers, but we have to take into account the different, um, different organizations that are funding, that are investing, and that they are promoting the, the research in, in, the, in the continent. And in this case, one of the aspects that we are leading is being quite involved in the, in the networks for AI that the European Commission is now setting. And four of, the, of these networks that are about to start are now leading by CLARE members. And here, very briefly, I would like to mention that we have a network of, re of research on trustworthy AI, a uh, one that is focused on research that enhance human intelligence, one that is focused on the use of AI and media and society, something that is quite important in these days of um, when we talk about fake news and how the algorithms can use to steer opinion. This is one of the, the very important um, uh, fields of application that we are uh, targeting here. And we are also uh, coordinating the uh, work among these different European networks. So we are, of course, not the only ones. There are many, many actors involved here, but we are playing a, an important role on how these activities are being developed across Europe. So this regards the research, but of course, we have to go beyond that. And there we have to also involve with the policymakers. And uh, you are uh, most uh, surely aware of the white paper on artificial intelligence are trying to set the, 
the playground for how AI or how the governance for AI in Europe will be will be developed and how different policies on, on promoting and upscaling AI will be set uh, as a response to this white paper we have sent 10 recommendations uh, and in their call for feedback where we talk about how there should be a substantial investment in AI research but also streamline the support and have a consequent um, policies for strengthening the innovation ecosystem here in Europe. And um, in parallel to that, we also have to take into account the human-centered aspects of developing this technology. So here we are putting a strong um, emphasis and, and putting recommendations on using um, frameworks like the responsible research and innovation, ethics by design, and increasing public awareness of um, AI as a way to make Europe stronger in what respects to AI development and AI applications in society. We are also participating along with other, other organizations in Europe in setting up uh, a program for public and private partnerships in in Europe for artificial intelligence, data, and robotics. This is a, a call that was made by the European Commission where they're trying to identify how these uh, public-private uh, partnerships should uh, identify what, the, what are the stakeholders, what the investment should be, and what are the strategic agendas that should be set for the upcoming years. And Claire is one of the, of the actors that is participating on defining this because making an AI, developing AI, and having impact with AI is something that cannot achieved only in research. Impact is only achieved once these technologies can fulfill needs of the end users. So we have to have a good integration of this generation of ideas, generation of knowledge, to the development and implementation of these ideas to the benefit of society. So in this um, in these lines, we have a growing base of institution, institutional supporters, as I mentioned, both at the level of research groups in academia and industry associations at the national and European level. We are working as well on the establishing, um, establishment of the innovation network. This is a way to make closer collaborations between researchers in academia and people in industry so that they can um, work together to identify what is the best way to move this uh, technology forward. So to close, I, I would like to mention and to highlight how developing AI and developing AI, AI for good and for all is a really multi-stakeholder endeavor that we want to have in this, this work to, done together by researchers in academia, in industry, by all the innovation ecosystem that is in charge of taking these ideas and put them in the street, put them in the market, as well as working alongside policymakers so that we can figure it out what is the best way to establish a proper and efficient governance mechanisms that allows us to fulfill this, um, this moral obligation of developing technologies that can benefit society while at the same time managing the risks that they entail. And last but not least, this is in a task where everybody should be involved and all, every actor in the society should have a way to know better about this and to interact with the different actors that are involved in their development. And with this, I would like to, to finish uh, this presentation. Please feel free to reach uh, me, to contact me, and to uh, ask me your questions, uh, give me your suggestions, and let us know how can Claire do help the European landscape on being stronger for AI, AI for all, all of AI with a human center focus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Very insightful what you're doing with Claire. I'm happy to see that we work here all together in Europe. Maybe you can um, share with us a little bit, what, what do you see are the challenges today to basically linking research with the practical application of AI? Mm -hmm. Well, AI as any novel technology has a, a big challenge in the sense that we don't know all the details of um, what does this technology entail once it is deployed. So we have a big um, drive to generate new applications for the society, 
researchers that are eager to provide these mechanisms, but we have um, certain, certain questions when we do something new. What, is, what will be the risk? What are these, um, these cases and scenarios where AI is actually bringing some added value? And this is one of the biggest questions that we, we, need to, we need to solve. And the most challenging part is that this, these questions may be context and application dependent. So, and this is where the stakeholder involvement becomes very important. When there is a need for having a, a bigger awareness of every actors that on what are the limitations on our knowledge and our, what are the uncertainties that we have and that we all agree to work together in this, uh, in this path to try to reduce these uncertainties to identify these cases where AI brings a particular added value. And that means that we need to have a financial risk because some of these projects will not gonna, will gonna, not gonna be successful, but we also have to do it in a way where we can draw lessons that allows us to be successful next time. And I think this is where we have to have a continuous dialogue that allows us to do so. I fully agree to that. Thank you very much for sharing. Yeah, it was a great pleasure for me as well to be here and moderate this talk today. And I wish all of you a great evening. Enjoy the rest of the summit and see you next time. <laughs>